It's impossible to do a proper review of the Suzuki DR650, a legendary adventure touring motorcycle, without actually including its main rival, the legendary equally as much Kawasaki KLR650. Stay tuned to find out why I think this is one of the best adventure touring motorcycles on the market ever made, but why I chose to sell this one and keep the KLR650. Greetings riders, Nick here with Pegasus Motorcycle Tours and Consulting, finally bringing you a review and comparison of two bikes that I believe to be one of the most iconic motorcycles, not only in the adventure touring industry, but in motorcycling in general. In fact, Kawasaki's best-selling bike, Suzuki's up there as well. So finally bringing you a review of the Suzuki DR650 SE and the Kawasaki KLR650. It took me a while to put this review together because I'm a firm believer that in order to properly review a motorcycle and give your honest opinion, you actually have to know it. And the only way to do it is through experience. So I'm finally in the position where I can say I can do that now. These are both my own bikes. As you know, my Pegasus project was done on a KLR just like this one, a 2008. This is a 2009. I have that bike in Europe and I put about 45,000 miles roaming through North America and, and Europe as well. And I got to know that bike inside and out. The DR, not so many miles on this, but uh, I've learned to love the bike. I should make a correction. These were my bikes until this morning when I sold it to uh, this gentleman by the name of Gene. Gene, Hi. nice to meet you. Uh, thank you for buying my bike. Uh, and uh, we had this idea. He has a, uh, well, why don't you tell us what your idea is for this bike, what okay. your plan is. So I'm a marine biologist and I'm planning to quit my job and surf and travel down through Central and South America over the course of six months to a year. So I met up with Nick and he offered to take me out and kind of show me how to, to ride because I haven't really experienced the ADV lifestyle yet. Yeah, today is a hell of a day. We've, we hit the dirt a few times and that's the best way to practice and to get to know the bike. So we're out here above Lake Elsinore, Southern California, Ortega Highway, one of the nicest rides that uh, are in our backyard. We're gonna spend the night tonight and we packed just as if you're gonna pack when you're alone roaming through Latin America. Now these two bikes are the two top contenders in budget adventure touring. Most people that have been around the world on a motorcycle have done it either on this bike or on this bike. They're also top selling motorcycles for Suzuki and Kawasaki. They've been around for decades, largely unchanged, which kind of speaks to its quality. If you've made it to this review, you already know that these bikes are bulletproof. The engines are super solid. That's why they have the reputation they have. You came to me looking for this bike because you've done your research and you knew kind of what you wanted. This bike is Armageddon ready now that we are in the coronavirus stage and full lockdown in Southern California. So, The bikers never take it seriously, huh? Yeah, for real. This bike can do it. It's ready to go. If you were to decide to go tomorrow when the border is open again, you can do that on this bike. Now there are some additions that I made to the bike that make it adventure ready. If I had to choose between these two bikes stock, which one to take on a tour, it would have to be the KLR simply because of the larger tank. You got a six gallon tank, six point sum compared to a three point sum. So it simply gives you more range. And when you're abroad in certain areas, that range is key. Everything that it has on its stock, it's budget oriented. We know that. We don't have to repeat that constantly. People are complaining about the tires. These are the stock Dunlop tires and the rubber mounted foot pegs, the lack of air protection and mirrors, etc. None of that really matters. I mean, the bike is ready to go out of the store and you know you can rely on it. And I speak from experience. For the DR, on the other hand, although it's more dirt oriented, everybody knows that. Uh, I'm hoping that this review gives you some more information that's a little more in depth and not just the surface level, which everybody can obviously see just from looking at them. The DR does need the bigger tank so that you can actually turn out the miles and the distance that you plan to do, especially when you're in areas where you can't find gas so readily, right? So this also has an aftermarket visor that helps you fight the wind fatigue. The wind is super fatiguing, and especially if you are in dirt and like today you were a little tense, so we got sweaty and it's hot, the sun's beating down, we're barely moving, the heat of the motorcycle's rising, and we're getting sweaty and the wind's beating us. That's what you wanna avoid. The windscreen, albeit short, it does a lot. It does much more than the stock 
KLR one. Other than that, the bike basically has a skid plate, something that's pretty required for trips like this. You're gonna bash the bottom, so you need it protected. It doesn't have any kind of engine guards other than this stock oil cooler guard here, but with the tusk panniers and with the bark busters here taking most of the, the force of the fall, I would argue that engine guards are secondary as opposed to the KLR, which definitely needs them to protect the plastic. That's the main difference. But you gotta keep in mind, that's added cost and it's added weight to the bike. I have to carry this and I learned that the hard way when I crashed in Spain, uh, somewhere in the mountains above Zaragoza in Basque country, I didn't have the engine guards and I cracked the radiator, which is on the left side. And that made, makes the vehicle overheat to this day. I haven't quite fixed it yet because I'm still on the road. My bike is in Europe. The beauty of the radiator is you can run cooler. It's arguably better for the longevity of the engine. However, it also adds weight and more things that can go wrong, right? So this bike is different in that it doesn't have that. It just has the oil cooler. It's supposed to work quite well, but it basically sprays cooled oil on the bottom of the piston, kind of cooling it down. So, I mean, if it works, it works. It's not overheating, it's great. I would I would actually rather have, have that than a radiator that, you know, I have to now take care of. So you do have aftermarket pegs installed on both these bikes. They both come with rubber mounted pegs. Not very good for off-road riding. And you saw today, it helps to stand and to let the bike float underneath you. So I replaced those. These are both Tusk. Everything on these bikes is Tusk. I've become quite a fan. I do notice though that the position of the foot pegs on the DR, especially with my thick Elsinore boots by Icon, is much more prohibitive. You'll sit on that bike later and you'll notice how you have a lot more freedom of movement. With this bike, I kind of have to dig underneath and then pull up. It's not in the best position, I would argue. It depends on the boots that you're wearing for sure. Both have stock handlebars. I'm five foot eight. And for me, the KLR handlebars fit better because I don't have to bend over, you know? With this, I, I could use another inch or two because I'm bending over. And if you've ever ridden for a few hours like that, the next day you can't move. Like your back is on fire, right? So that's something you're gonna wanna look into. See how you feel. Don't change anything for the time being. Right. Take another month or two of hardcore testing, exploring, getting to know the bike, and then you'll know what you need to change. But I would, I would argue for that, that would be a good change to make. What else? The bike has steel braided brake lines. The brakes on these bikes is uh, budget oriented. I mean, it stops the bike. It's nothing to boast about, but it does the job. But if you want to strengthen the brakes, the first thing to do is to change the brake lines. Uh, steel braided brake lines don't expand and therefore they're a little bit more responsive. Other than that, and the Tusk luggage and the seat concept. Seats, you basically have more or less a stock DR. The stock seat on both bikes is tragic. I mean, your ass hurts. I remember when I first started touring on the KLR, I mean, I had to stop every 20, 30 miles. It was a nightmare and I never found, in those 50,000 miles, I've never found a solution other than just like deal with it, you know? And I've used the gel, I've used the sheepskin, I've used the little wooden balls, if you remember, like our dads used to put in the car back in the day. None of that helped and it just raises you off the ground and it, th these bikes are already tall. My preference for luggage is usually soft. There's many reasons for that. They're a lot less costly, they're easy to repair, they're lighter, they don't typically fit as much, but you learn to live with less in that regard. And there's not as much danger of breaking your leg or catching your foot when you're riding dirt, especially with ruts. Or like today, you actually got stuck. Why don't you describe what happened? Uh, my left leg got stuck under one of these hard cases and I couldn't get it out, so it was pretty scary. <laughs> Yeah, it was great yeah. learning experience. You didn't get hurt, so that's kind of good. Yeah. Uh, one thing that I really used to miss, oddly enough, is a place to sit and eat my food. You know, I would always be obviously in backcountry and whatnot. A lot of times I would just kind of miss having a place to sit, work or whatever, if you're carrying your computer, which I assume you will. These Tusk bags or panniers, luggage, is slowly starting to shift my opinion on hard luggage. For one, they're lockable, so you know you're kind of safe. They're not very pricey. You can get them under 400 with the carriers on the side. The carriers are actually usable with other luggage as well, like Pelican cases or soft luggage. They disconnect quickly, as we've seen. I'll show you that I'm actually using it now to film this. I might regret doing this, but I basically, I'm not carrying a tripod because that's what I'm using. In the Vistram review, I also, funny enough, I sold the Vistram to this guy called John, and I immediately regretted it. Not selling it to him, just selling it. So I went on Craigslist like the next day. I'm like, oh, there it is, another one similarly equipped. And I bought it and I call him I'm like, John, 
I regret selling the bike, but I'm glad because I found another one. Let's go for a ride. So we actually went for a weekend ride oh, nice. the next week. So it's kind of nice. Yeah. So John, it was his first time on road and he fell a bunch of times. Oh. On his, he had soft luggage. Okay. On mine, I had the Italian Jivy plastic cases. I didn't crash, but I'm also not new to the game. And if I did crash, no doubt those cases would have broken. He just scraped his. Right. And you can always replace the zipper at a shoe shop. That's why I like the soft luggage. But I saw a video, I'm gonna link it in the bottom. I forget the name of this YouTuber, but he basically put these cases through a torture test. I mean, he really almost destroyed them. I and mean, it's amazing. He drags them behind the bike. They beat them with bats and throw them and drop the bike and all these things. And they really hold their shape and they still close and they're still watertight. I'm sold in that regard. So it would be nice to have, especially because I can use the carriers for something else. You also mentioned you might prefer softer luggage. You have the option to actually do that. It's really nice that they're removable too. Yeah. yeah good stuff. So I started this new web episode series called Epic Rides. You saw the first episode of it in Italy. Episode two is going to be in Utah. Around Moab, there is this park called Canyonlands. And around it, there's this amazing road. It's 90 miles and it's very difficult. And my partner actually crashed his GS 1200 and we were stuck up there for like four days. So it would have been nice at, at times when we take a break to eat, to have a place to sit. Yeah. And it would have been nice when we were waiting there for hours in the heat yeah. to have some shade, which right. there's none of in, in the desert. It was like 113 degrees. We were there in July. I don't know why it was amazing, but it was brutal, right? You can argue this is life and death when you're immobile without service. 90 miles away from any form of help or civilization, so meaning you can't walk away. No water and no shade and limited food, obviously. So what I would actually do, if you can't cower behind your bike on the side of the shade, you can stack these two up and make sure they don't fall, tie them or whatever, and put a tarp down or whatever you have for your tent, and you have some shade. I've had to do that twice already. Yeah. Once when John actually crashed and I was waiting for him, okay. I'm like, where did that guy go? Why is he up here? And I'm just cooking. I mean, it was it was only about 45 minutes, but I wish I had some shade. Right. I could have done that easily with yeah. these cases. So I like them a lot. I mean, they remove easily and, and they lock to the bike and they lock the top as well. They're easy to load. They're easy to carry. So I'm a fan of Tusk. I find that to be the case as of late. Looking at the bikes, it's quite clear to see that the DR is more dirt oriented. Uh, if you're here, you know that by now. It's got more ground clearance. It's about 10 and a half inches to eight and a half inches. So you're skipping over the things a lot easier in that regard. It's got more travel in the suspension by about two inches. A substantial difference of, of two inches of, of travel. You know, you definitely feel it. Its brother is the DR400, DRZ. That's actually a, a water-cooled bike. Interestingly enough, it performs similar, even, even though it has 250 cc's less. It's also quite a lot lighter. The KLR has an upgraded suspension. It's got progressive shocks and springs. The DR has a stock suspension and I gotta say just those two extra inches and the ability to clear the ground better gives you so much more confidence. Now you gotta think you have these bikes loaded down with everything you need to live off that bike, let's say indefinitely. So you got your kitchen, you got your tools, you got your clothing, your electronics, computers, drones, whatever. We, we have that on the bike right now. We're ready to go. So there's a lot of weight on top. This bike I just got, it's barely broken in. And because of the coronavirus, my luggage is delayed. So I don't have any luggage for it at the moment, but at the same time, it's a weekend trip and I basically have Gene carry all my stuff <laughs> to, to have him experience the weight. And I gotta tell you, the 60 pounds difference or so between these two bikes stock does so much. To, for a guy like me, 5'8", 5'9", 165 pounds, to be able to maneuver it. You gotta understand, if you crash, you will crash. You're not gonna crash going straight to a very easy Pacific kind of environment. You're gonna crash when you're on a hill and you stall, when you slip, whatever. So moral of the story, you're gonna crash when it's not opportune for you to crash. And it's gonna be very difficult for you to pick that bike up. Those 60 pounds matter. Every pound counts. And that's why a lot of people who choose the DR go back to the DRZ because it's another 40 pounds lighter. So then you have a legitimate dirt bike that can tackle any dirt road that you put at there. So most of the time you're gonna be able to avoid stuff that's very difficult, but sometimes you'll be like the little red riding hood, just 
uh, always looking in the distance, seeing that beautiful road, taking it, seeing another beautiful road, taking it. A little bit after that, you find yourself in a single track that you don't know how to get out of. It would be good to have a bike that you are completely confident in that can do that stuff, you know? I argue this bike does it much better than the KLR. The KLR does have upgraded springs. They're both soft when they're stock for both bikes, but the KLR feels it more because it's heavier. It's like a big pig. I mean, it's not a dirt bike by any means, but it can do dirt roads, you know, and that's all you need it to do. I see commercials, for example, when the Africa Twin came out, its promotion was filmed exactly in this road that's going to be the topic of our epic ride series episode number two the white rim road in moab i recognize the road and they're bunny hopping and, and racing through that thing you'll never ride your motorcycle like that when you're touring alone that's that's what i argue no matter what your talent and ability is when you're alone in some place where you know there's no help nobody's going to be there to respond nobody's going to find you god forbid if you're off the road there's no way that you're going to be riding your motorcycle like they do in the commercials. I guarantee you that. All this bike needs to do is get you out of there. Do it and not break. These bikes are super reliable. They're easy to work on. Even, for example, adjusting the chain, I would argue is a little bit easier on the DR than the KLR. Just in virtue of the system that it uses, it's got a lobe with notches. The KLR is a little trickier, but nothing you can't do at the campground at night. I do like the tank of the KLR more. Even aside from this, he's flying. Wow. Ortega Highway, man. People love it out here. So this is the Acerbis tank. It's a 22 liter. It's got obviously more range. It's plastic, so it's lighter. It doesn't rust inside. What I don't like about it is it peaks at the top, so it's difficult to uh, find a tank bag that's going to actually fit well. It also doesn't lock. This matters if you're parking your bike in a bad part of town for the night or somewhere where it's urban and populated where you have to worry about your gas being siphoned. These bikes do not have gas gauge, so you kind of have to calculate and count your mileage. And if you come in the morning thinking everything is set to go, you might realize the opposite. So I got to say, I do like the stock tank of the KLR. One, it's huge, so it gives you a big range. Two, it's metal. It allows for my favorite tank bag is the Moto-centric tank bag. I like it a lot. You're obviously going to have all your main things there, including some of your documentation, your food, your, maybe your camera. I do carry a Bell bicycle bag for this crossbar right here. You can get it anywhere at Target, at Walmart, etc. And it's just, it's meant for bicycles, but it, it will clip on here. And I keep my DSLR there for quick access, my glasses maybe. A smaller DSLR would fit there perfectly. But I do like the KLR tank because it allows for the mounting of a magnetic tank bag. This tank bag I like a lot because it comes with straps. I prefer that it's magnetic. I can just put it on my back and be off. You can't do that with the DR because it doesn't have a big tank. The stock tank is too small. Another actual reason why I like the KLR tank more is that in this area, there are tank bags that look triangular that fit here perfectly. Sedici makes one, Joe Rocket, Manta has this shape and they're very useful. They get you a little more room for your toiletries or whatever needs to be accessed more quickly in that regard. Even your first aid kit, if that's what you choose to do. Aesthetics, it almost doesn't matter, right? You know that I don't like to talk about aesthetics because everybody has a different opinion and it's legit, you know? You, you might think this is ugly. I don't think it's particularly pretty, but it does fine. You might think this is amazing or ugly. None of that matters. What matters though is the fact that this bike is substantially less attention grabbing than this bike. So if you are somewhere in a place where motorcycle theft is common and a bike looks nicer to a passerby who has bad intentions, I'm perfectly happy with the fact that this looks like a bike from the 80s. The pictures might not come out as nice, but the bike does what it needs to do. It's reliable, I can work on it. That's all I care for. What I can tell you for a fact Having lived in Rio, for example, and getting to know much of Brazil and much of uh, Mexico and other parts of Latin America, in fact, having lived in a favela in Rio where when I moved in, the gangster shot down a police helicopter flying over. If I pulled in that, I would not come out with that bike. I guarantee you that. Uh, it would be taken from me. It's too flashy, even a KLR. And I never neglect to remember that bikes like this are at least three times as expensive in most Latin American countries and therefore three times more desirable and three times less common. 
So for us, three and a half, four thousand dollars for a bike like the KLR is no big deal. In fact, that's exactly what you want in case like I did crashing in Spain and you might need to just ditch it or it gets stolen. You can survive. It's three grand, right? I would actually prefer to ride down south in Baja and other parts with a bike that looks less attention grabbing and less modern than a bike like the KLR. Some of you might laugh, but until you've lived in places where you're afraid to go out at seven and you get robbed at gunpoint for your shoes, then we'll discuss it. But I'm telling you, I would be more comfortable riding in places like Brazil or Mexico with a bike like that than with a bike like that because of the aesthetics. The only reason why I decided to keep the KLR and sell the DR is simply because I already have a KLR 650 in Europe with about 45 amazingly memorable, beautiful miles on the clock, waiting on some maintenance such as the valve clearance and carb work. For that reason, it would be so much easier to have the same tools and spare parts. But needless to say, there definitely is a little bit of that brand loyalty. So what the DR ultimately is, it's simply a reliable, dependable base, something you could work on over the years and build on to create your perfect adventure touring machine. The bikes are legendary for a reason. They have an incredible following now over three decades long. It's really a damn shame that Kawasaki decided not to produce them anymore. I hope you have all the information you need to make an informed decision. You won't go wrong with either bikes. Again, thank you for watching. Please participate in the conversation. Share this video with the riding community so that we can help the channel grow and help bring you more videos like this. In the meantime, ride safe. Nick, I'm out.